So I show up to this office with earrings and a Tommy Hilfiger shirt. Yes, you did. <laughs> and the guy looks at me, and this was the job interview. He says, take off your earrings and put on a collared shirt and come back next week and we'll hire you. <laughs> so I did, and he hired me. Hi, and welcome to the Story of Podcast, where storytellers disrupt. I'm David Neronia. And I am Fabiano Altamura. And before we dive in with my Spanish fellow over here, up telenovela from Mexico, um, <laughs> please remember to like, subscribe, follow, and give us that five-star review. Today's a very, very special episode of Storia. Very special episode. I have one of my best friends on, Chris Lamb, who is, well, for one, one of the things that he does is he's a mortgage broker, but he is exceptionally successful and wise at all things financial. He's a father of three children. He is um, part of a, a ministry. He's on the board of Brave Co. with Jason Vallotton. Owns the space that we're currently Owns in. Owns the studio that we currently in. We produce, help produce his podcast, Money Hole. Um, but the reason why we wanted to have him on today is because he's such an interesting character. His journey is so interesting and how he came from nothing to being the very successful businessman that he is. And not only that, he's mentored David and I in our finances. He's helped us in so many ways to become savvy, not just in investments, but with stewarding mm -hmm. the money God has given you. And it could be the most little amount seed, like the, 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 the widow with two mites. The amount doesn't matter, but how you steward that money is really important. So Chris, thanks for coming on the podcad. Thanks for having me, gentlemen. Yeah. Glad to be here. It's so cool. I don't know why it took us so long to do this, but I'm glad. I'm glad for season two. We save the best. We save the best for next. We save the best. Chris, we want to hear about your first, like we're going to do a two-parter here. So like, yeah. firstly, your journey, um, how you came into becoming like a mortgage advisor mm -hmm. and like becoming a businessman, because that's yeah. not the sum total of what you are. I mean, you're right. a coach. You're part of these very wealthy groups. But what I love about you is like, I guess in the term of how a disruptor you are, you're also very, very conservative in your approach to all things financial mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So I just want to hear about your story, dude. Sure. Like I want our viewers to know how you came into being the person who you are today. Were you born wealthy? What was your, your beginnings? That's a great question. No, I was not. I was born with a uh, single parent household, uh, lower middle class and alcoholic, you know, mm -hmm. abusive family. So I got into drugs and alcohol, you know, pretty young. And I had no, I, I didn't, I, I didn't actually see a future in my life, you know? So, so I definitely, this definitely wasn't what I was born into. I was in high school, actually. I was telling you guys before we started filming that, you know, I struggled with the traditional learning like so many kids do, right? Just the sitting there and I got diagnosed with ADHD multiple times before I was 25 and I never did anything about it. But when I went to high school, there was a way that you could go to work and get school credits as a junior. And I did that my junior and senior year in the mortgage industry. Huh. A friend of mine, his uncle had a mortgage shop. This was 2001 and 2002. So this was right before, you know, the late 2000s before things kind of- So this was like a high school work experience type thing? It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it was like noon to five, uh -huh. uh, Monday through Friday. You know, and growing up poor, well, relative to you know America, I, I, I was like, you're telling me that I can leave school at lunch and make money and be <laughs> able to buy things that, that my mom can't get me? They probably had you at just leave school at lunch. Yeah, you would just leave right at lunch. <laughs> like you would just like walk out. And the first couple of times I did it, I felt like I was robbing a store or something. <laughs> I was like looking over my shoulder and, but it was a huge blessing because not only did I end up in an industry that has been a huge blessing to me and a lot of my, my family and friends, but it, it also, you know, I learned a lot of personal responsibility early. I was able to make money. And you know, when I graduated high school, I never got out. So, so that was really kind of the beginning for me. I've been doing this for a long time. It wasn't always great. It's there's been all kinds of ups and downs, but 
um, it's, it's been a 22 year journey now mm -hmm. that I've been in this industry. So humble beginning, man. Um, obviously a lot of family stuff that you mm -hmm. navigated addiction, all of these kinds of obstacles. Do you remember thinking back to this, uh, was it a family member that owned the business or a friend? That, that owned the financial advising business that you did the works exchange with? It was a friend of mine's uncle okay. who owned the company. So thinking back to this now, teenage Chris, do you remember something that this man said or did or illustrated to you that kind of changed the course of your life? Well, that didn't happen until later. When I met him, I walked in and this was the early days of the mortgage industry. And so what I... When I talk to mortgage people, because I coach them, we joke around for those of the those of us that have been around this long, you know, if you remember back then, the the industry was completely different. Like we joke around and say if you could fog a mirror, you could get a loan. <laughs> you know, oh yeah, yeah. The, they were making some pretty bad loans, you know. So as long as you were good with whiteout and I mean it was it was it was a wild west <laughs> back then. So creative thinking. Exactly. So I'm a I'm a rave DJ, you know, cuz I and and I love DJing and I still I still mess with house music to this day. Oh but I'm but I'm still living a little bit of a party lifestyle although at this point it had not completely taken over my life and I was controlling it. So I show up to this office with earrings and a Tommy Hilfiger shirt. Yes, he did. <laughs> and the guy looks at me and this was the job interview. He says Take off your earrings and put on a collared shirt and come back next week and we'll hire you. <laughs> wow. So I did. And he hired me. And so that was the beginnings of my, you know, my entry into the mortgage industry. But as far as the turning point in my life, I, you know, that wasn't until 2019. Mm -hmm. Or sorry, that was, sorry, 2003. Mm -hmm. July 15th, 2003. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd been in the industry for uh, a full year now, out of high school. I'm making good money. But at this point, Drugs and alcohol kind of went from something I was having fun with to completely, I was a slave and I was no longer able to pay my bills, you know, do anything without being under the influence. And, and that, that was also the night that I really felt like I surrendered to the Lord and I asked him to help me and, and I haven't had a drink since. So did, that was later. Did you get into drugs and alcohol due to the music industry? Like no. It, I got into drugs and alcohol because I had a spiritual malady, you know, like mm. most of us do. And for me, I just felt so empty growing up and that I was, I just was, you know, sort of almost predispositioned to finding things that made me feel different or allowed me to not feel mm. the way I felt. Mm. And so it was a lot of fun at first, but it, you know, it, it, took, it really became, the thing, it was almost like oxygen. I just had to, I could not be alone in my own skin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those things, they just have a way of taking over. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. what was the point where you decided to stop? Well, it wasn't really a decision. It was, it was more a jumping off point, you know, mm -hmm. it was, so I was, in the end, I was, uh, I was drinking every day. I was using pills. I mean, you know, I'm not even 21 yet, you know, so I'm just getting whatever I can and I was pretty much homeless. I mean, I wasn't like on the curb with a brown bag or anything like that. I was heading in that direction, but I was, I didn't have a, I was living place to place. I couldn't keep a job. I'd worked for four or five mortgage companies, lost my job because you don't show up to work when you're drinking. And, right. you know, so this one night I'm driving down in Cottonwood, California, and I just, I was at the end. I couldn't imagine my life going on one more day the way it was. But I also couldn't imagine living any other way because it's all I knew. It was my identity. Right. It was my identity. It was like it was it was a death. But I was, I was so hopeless that mm -hmm. I ended up just saying, "If you're really there, I'll do whatever you say. If you, if you help me, I don't know how to change." And, and I had an encounter with the Lord, that was the, one of the most powerful encounters I've ever had in my life. Um, I had a repressed memory of when I lied to my dad at like four years old and told him I did something on accident. And I just went through, he took me through this story, storyline of all these things I had done in my life up to the current moment. Mm. And, and I just remember being so filled with hopelessness, guilt, remorse, and regret that I was like, there's no way for me to go on. Mm. And in that moment, my car was filled with unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And it was almost as if he said, here's the road I had for you. You don't have to go back. I'll take you right to where you always should have been right now. And it was almost it's, in my mind's eye, there was this bridge from the road that I was on up into that point, 19 years down this road to the road that I should have been. 
And I was able to just go straight back to this path that he had for me. Mm. And in that moment, I knew I would never drink again. Wow. And I knew I would never use drugs again, that I had been delivered. But I also knew I needed, I needed help. I needed friends. I needed people around me. Mm-hmm. And and that was divine because up until that point, I thought I could do everything on my own. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it always blows me away, right? Like when you meet somebody in their current moment, I know. saved, successful dude or, or, or successful marriage. I mean, what, there's so many different measures of success. And then you hear about their pre-Jesus story, and it is the most disruptive reboot of a story and revision that you could ever imagine because i can't imagine chris in this way yeah, you've no, been around can't. no it's and the thing is as well you never you 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 couldn't believe it no yeah because he's a new man because it's a, a new, new creation you're a new yeah. man but then now you you successful successful family sometimes when you say that people can't even believe it yeah mm-hmm. or they write it off as cheesy but you know it I, I don't know about you. I think we've all had a similar story, you know, being mentally tormented at some kind of rock bottom mm-hmm. moment. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah, of most of us are so stubborn yeah. and so right. pig headed that we've got to hit specifically men. I think more than anything, yeah. we've got to hit some real gritty, almost death moment in order for us to. So Chris, you have this kind of uh salvation sobering moment on a highway in California. Let's fast forward to when did you reconnect with this seed that was planted in the financial, the financial markets mm-hmm. in the financial realm. How do you yeah. get back there? You know, well, in the beginning it was very humble. I, I stayed unemployed for six months. I volunteered. Wow. I started going on missions trips. I thought I was going to be a missionary, you know, going to the nations, honestly. And, and I was almost denying this business thing, mm. even though I had favor there, the relationships and, you know, the people I thought would be, kicking me out of their office when I heard I got sober and, and I, they all just wanted to help me. Wow. And that's really been my whole story is just people, the right people at the right time. And, and so anyways, it, it, at some point I realized I'm not so sure I'm supposed to live in Africa yet and I need to make money. So I got back into the industry. And at this time it was just before the financial crisis of 2008. So it was oh five oh six. Right Good timing. There. It was great time. Yeah. <laughs> so I get back into the business and I start doing a lot better, you know, naturally I'm showing up to work <laughs> and, uh, I'm telling the truth. So I'm, I'm working hard. I'm trying to practice, uh, integrity and honesty and work ethic and just being a man of my word, showing up on time, you know, basic principles. A lot of people probably get from parents mm-hmm. and opportunities just keep coming. And so this first broker I work for, he gives me a great opportunity and we're, I, I start actually helping with, uh, we start fixing a lot of people's credit and we're doing some debt consolidation and we're doing mortgages at the same time. So I had a really good foundation on the Fair Debt Collections Practice Act um, and then the Fair Credit uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And so we did a lot of stuff to help people that didn't think they could buy a house, learn how to kind of get to the place where they could. Was that unusual? Because I mean, to help somebody get out of debt so that they can, and not just denying them, was that unique to the business? It was. Yeah, it was, it was a unique time back then. Um, but there was just, there was a lot more people that I, from what I remember that just had, it was kind of honestly like right now, it was, it was right before a recession. A lot of people had, uh, gotten into a lot of debt and, you know, their equity was exploding in their homes and people were financing a lot of stuff that they couldn't afford. If you remember I do. Yeah, that totally. time. <laughs> remember it very, very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I do. I remember your story. <laughs> well, you know, and everyone got, I mean, to some degree, everyone got affected by mm. what happened in 2008. So, so 2008 comes and I, I'll never forget. I'm sitting there at my desk and I'm getting ready to lock loans and I have a TV on and I'm watching the news of what's going on with wall street. And literally email after email of companies shutting down, shutting down. We're not taking your loans. We're shutting down operations. Within f- five days, most of the investors we brokered our loans to were no longer in business. Oh, my, oh gosh. my goodness. They were shut down. Fannie and May and Freddie Mac fail uh, a week or two later and get bailed out. It was a crazy time. Mm-hmm. And around this time, there was a guy by the name of Eric Hyatt in town who we, he and I were going to the same church and he was also kind of coming out of a radical um, transformation. And he had just set up an office in town with a small mortgage bank and they were specializing in um, a home equity conversion mortgage, which some, some people refer to as a reverse mortgage. And they were doing pretty well. 
and he had been kind of telling me I should come over there for a while. And I was like, ah, what I got's going on pretty good. I called him that day. I was like, Hey, is that, <laughs> that opportunity still there? And so I go work with Eric for a while and we do really well. And he builds that company up and they end up selling it. And he, it was a really cool story to be a part of it. And the owners of the company in San Diego, I still know today, they're incredible guys. They all, they're believers. And I mean, they were sewing into this ministry in Africa and it was, it was just a really awesome opportunity. Eric and I were going on mission trips together to China and different places and, um, but what happened with, with that industry, like all, a lot of different industries and economies, they have seasons, right? And regulations started changing that industry. And I started doing more purchase loans for, you know, people buying their first home or their, their second home. And that company was really not the right company for that model. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up moving to the company that I was with for 12 years, ended up becoming a, uh, you know, a shareholder in that company and got into coaching and you know, that was, that was, a that was kind of how that whole story went. So it's not like you were called into business then you just kind of fell into it and you were yes. good at it. Yes. Yeah. I think I, I don't, you know, one of the things they talked about at that, that retreat we went mm -hmm. to, and I really believe in, he's like, I don't know of how much God cares about what you actually do. Mm. I think he cares a lot more about how you treat the people along the way Yeah, and who you become in the yep. process. So I went to a world mandate conference in Waco, Texas. I went there every year and I was waiting on this word from the Lord, like all the people who were seemingly more spiritual than me <laughs> seemed to get that he was going to say Africa or he was going to, a, a leaf was going to flow by and show me a sign. Although I never got those, I knew I was going to get one and I go in and I'm, my wife and I were newly married and we're prepared to go to the nations and I'm still doing mortgages. We're doing pretty well. And I remember that there was, I looked at the pamphlet and there was this, there was this one panel, it was called Missions in Business. And I was like, oh, that seemed kind of interesting. And, you know, I had never heard that concept before. Mm -hmm. right? And so I go in there and it's the owner of the Kansas City Chiefs at the time. Oh, wow. And he shows up, he gets up on the stage and he's got, I remember, I remember looking at him, he looked at this very simple guy. And right before he starts talking, Jimmy Seibert, the, the senior pastor, says, I was meeting with a bunch of mortgage brokers this week and they were asking me what the will of God is in their life. Apparently there was a lot of mortgage brokers asking that question during that time, <laughs> as there is probably right now. Right now, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, that's very interesting. And he told my story. And then the Kansas City Chiefs owner goes through his whole story. And he didn't talk about getting called to buy in the Kansas City Chiefs. He just talked about this story of doing life and meeting people and how God used relationships to not only give him these opportunities to do incredible things to make the world a better place, but to meet incredible people and that he just started finding what his superpower and his skill was along the path. And that really made sense to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it still does today. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I want to park here for a bit, mm -hmm. but cause I'm really into this kind of calling thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like I really believe in focusing on dreams are going to mm -hmm. have dreams. And I think the desires that you have in your heart are a direct indication yeah. of maybe your calling. Yeah. But it isn't like that for everybody. And I don't even know if that is even theologically true. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, you fell into business. You're obviously very good at it. You didn't necessarily know it was a calling, but you're right. I mean, I wonder if it's a mixture of the two. I, listen, I'm reading this book right now by Robert Green called Mastery. And what he does is he talks about mastering, going from apprentice mm -hmm. to master. And the way that he lays it out is he tells the story of like Leonardo da Vinci and mm -hmm. uh, Einstein. And so he picks like little chunks of biographical story to illustrate where they are in this spectrum, this journey from apprentice to master. But over and over and over again, I'm struck by this thing. And, it, and it's interesting because I know what you're, you're pointing at. Mm -hmm. like you had a very specific internal fire that came up and out of you, right? Yeah. It, oddly enough, mine is very similar to Chris's in that way. Mm. In that, as I'm hearing Chris's story, it really came out of, desperation and relationship. Like he was a kid who desperately needed to get the hell out of the classroom because he was <laughs> bored out of his mind. He had a ton of stuff in him, probably not uh, uh, called out or discovered because life just hadn't called it out of him. And mm -hmm. then he stumbles into this office because he just wants to get out of school at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. And there's somebody who's kind or generous or takes a moment 
or you were a breathing body in the right time and whatever. Now you stumble into this and then all of a sudden this unexpressed gift starts getting cultivated. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think about me and how I got into acting. It was an English teacher who said, you got to come audition for my musical because mm -hmm. you sing and I need another kid to play a 12 year old, even though you're 17. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, 40 years later, I've been Still in the, in but if I hadn't had that teacher, yeah. I still teach what I was taught in high school English today. Had she not told me about mythology, this, I never, ever would have even known that. Some, so I often wonder, I don't know if that's the hand of God leading so. you to that place and mm -hmm. or this, this, I think more and more I'm realizing that a lot of life is what you get exposed to and what you make of it. Mm -hmm. It's conditional prophecy, like the, the, like the, you know, the Israelites. It's like, yeah, they were supposed to get there, but they had to partner with God. They took the long way around. Yeah. Some people get there. Some people don't. Yeah. 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 I think that's, I definitely think that he's big enough and we're all so uniquely different uh -huh. Yeah, that for us to think that there's only one way for him to there you go. call us. It's Romans. Would be kind right? of, yeah. would all be kind of silly. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, and, uh, and because who knows? I mean, there's been these big decisions I've made in the last year where I've, I mean, for me, if, if it wasn't a calling, I don't know what one is just really big decisions I've made. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think there's room for both. He's always the God of both and. Yeah, he is. And I think he knows you intimately. Totally. Mm -hmm. Like, so he knew for you getting out, you know, single parent family, getting into drugs and alcohol, stopping you on the road and mm ha. -hmm. Huh, yeah. And then by somebody's kindness, like you as well, calling out something in you, mm -hmm. I think that ignites something. For me, it was watching a movie going, I don't want to do anything else but that. Isn't it interesting you know? too how passion is infectious as well? Because being around somebody who like, like my, my English teacher was so passionate yeah. about writing and storytelling yeah. that it just almost like a virus. But Chris, what strikes me about you also knowing you personally is I don't, I, I've never felt from you that the financial markets, industry, mortgages is just business to you. It, it seems like it's more, that it's about mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. What is, what does it mean to you to help somebody get a home? You know, th there was definitely a time for me where there was the survival component, right? For all of us in any job. And um, although I did love people and I love their stories and I think that today being in this business for 22 years, mm. having learned so much of what to do and what not to do, not just for me, but for everybody else. I, and then just looking at our world and looking at our country and looking at the economy and looking at the federal reserve and looking at the system that we live in mm. and work in. I, I think that it's really become something that's so important for me to teach people how to steward their money. Well, and also to, you know, help people to realize that that alone is not going to make you happy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So the wholehearted thing has really been important to me because I achieved success beyond my wildest dreams. Clearly I don't deserve it and did not, you know, and I wasn't happy. And, and I've, so I've had to learn that it truly is a holistic approach to life and although I don't necessarily believe in balance, I do think that we have to pay attention to everything. Our marriage, our kids, our, our health, our money is important. And what I find with people is a lot of people who have it all in one area, they're missing it in another. And a lot of times that's money. And because of what I do, that's what I, where I try to help, help them. You know? But a lot of the friends that we run with, who you guys know, their strength isn't money. But they have a strength where I've been really weak. Mm -hmm. And that's why this friend group I've been running with the last few years has been such a such a gift for me because yeah. emotional health was not on my radar mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know. Because a lot of people I think, you know, not having finances. I know we say that being wealthy is not the sum total of happiness in mm -hmm. your life. But it certainly does help. It oh, opens absolutely. doors. It it definitely it definitely helps you. But but for you understanding that having a lot of wealth, but going after this wholehearted lifestyle, what does that look like for you? Because you obviously arrived in the other area and realized that wasn't what it's all cracked up to be. Obviously it's afforded you a, mm -hmm. a great lifestyle and stability for your family and legacy for your family. Mm -hmm. But what does that wholehearted lifestyle, including yeah. finances look like for you? 
Well, yeah, and just to be clear, if someone has a choice between making a lot of money and not making much, making a lot of money is much better. <laughs> I want to be very clear on that. Would, absolutely. <laughs> I, and I don't care who you are, I promise you, it's better. Um, because what it does is it, you know, it, it can be problematic because it exposes what's always been there, right? But I'll give you an example. So I'm a, I'm a business coach and I'm, I'm coaching this guy the other day who's in his 20s and has a lot of money, millions. And he's very successful. And he just, uh, he, I get on the phone with him and he tells me his sciatica is out and he hasn't been sleeping. And he tells me that he was laying in the, his bed the other night. And he's, he, he told me, hey, you remember that wreck I got in? He had gotten in a, an accident with his Porsche uh, a year, six months ago. And he almost died and he got, he, he was knocked out and unconscious and all this. He said, I was laying in bed the other night and I watched this Instagram video and this football player had the same symptoms I have. And he had a brain clot and I literally passed out in my bed so stiff. I had to go to the hospital. Mm. And so he's telling me all this and I'm listening. And I, I, I said, Hey, are you sure you didn't have a panic attack? He said, you know, that's what they think it was. I said, I'm going to tell you something. You don't have a brain clot. I said, you're dealing with anxiety and you had a panic attack. And, and I said, let's talk about that for a minute. And, and I said, so you understand, first of all, that nothing good comes from your phone at midnight in your bed, right? <laughs> I said, I would plug that thing in the bathroom and I would stop bringing it to bed, number one. I said, so number two, I, I said, you, you know, it's not rational for you to have the type of fear where you pass out in your bed and you wreck sports cars. You understand that, right? He's like, of course. I said, so what you have to understand is your body is sending you a text message right now. And it's telling you that there's something going on psychologically. And that's not a bad thing. I said, the problem that you and lots of people have is you think you're the only one dealing with it and you don't want to call it what it is. But I'm going to tell you right now, lots of people are dealing with that. Mm -hmm. I said, and the solution is very simple. It's not as hard as you think it is. It's a few simple things. And he's like, well, I just started going to church. I said, hey, man, church is great. I said, but I'm not talking about going to church. And so I ended up kind of taking them through some exercise and then telling them some things to do. And in the end, I prayed for him. And when I looked up on the Zoom meeting, he had tears in his eyes and he was crying. And and so so that's what I mean. You know, it's like I'm in these worlds where I'm helping people buy their first home, their second home, their third home, or their 50th home. And I've been super privileged to help people accumulate wealth. And I feel like that's really a value that I bring. Mm -hmm. But I also have this group that I get to coach of people who are very successful in the world but they have poverty in a lot of other areas, mm -hmm. you know, and these are areas that I've also been able to work on. Mm -hmm. I also have experience failing miserably in those areas. And in some way by me helping them, I'm, I'm reinforcing my mm -hmm. own health, you know? Yeah. Sounds about as missional as you can possibly it get. It does. Right? And a lot of people don't know this as well, but it's like, you know, you also have not been handed everything on a plate. I mean, you went through cancer mm -hmm. when you just got married mm -hmm. so talk us through that because that was another hardship that you've overcome not just yeah. single parent family no money drugs alcohol you're in your first year of marriage right and then you first month first month of marriage and then you find out you get cancer yeah so i got di i got diagnosed in with cancer um gosh i want to say that was 2009 and my wife and i were dating we went through a surgery because I had stage four wow. and they had to wait 90 days to test me to see if they got it all. 90 days in, we're engaged to be married. Um, I do a CAT scan and I have cancer pretty much all over. So our parents conspired and ended up having a little ceremony for us in a little church in town because our wedding was a ways out and we weren't living together at the time and we wanted to during that time. And so, yeah, we went through chemo for the first four months of our, wow. of our uh, marriage and and uh, it was rough. I mean, it was, you know, anyone that's been through chemo knows it's like you're pretty much a dead man walking. I mean, it kills all the good stuff in your body to kill the cancerous cells. So you, that's why you lose your hair. And, you know, it was, it was pretty rough. But mm -hmm. honestly, man, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Mm -hmm. I why? mean, it was, I'll tell you the thing about cancer or anyone that's had a near-death experience, I've had three. <laughs> you, you really lose the fear of death and you become pretty clear with um, what happens afterwards. And you just don't have the fear of that anymore. Wow. 
you know, so I had a motorcycle wreck when I was 17, drinking with a friend at 75 miles an hour without a helmet. We both, oh, we, we wrecked, he, he died instantly and I lived and walked away. And I had an incident with drugs, you know, early on and when I was in high school actually, and then this. And so, you know, when I got my clean bill of health, I was sitting there with the doctor and he's looking at my chart and it was an amazing guy who retired, but he was one of the best doctors in the area. And he looks at my chart and he says, I'm going to get to do with you that what I don't get to do with most people. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to probably be okay. And if I were you, I'd walk away from this place and never look back. And that's what I did. Now, in hindsight, that wasn't the best advice <laughs> because I ended up pouring my whole life into my work day one. Mm -hmm. And that ended up causing me some problems with my marriage because three months into that, I mean, I literally left that doctor's office. And there was this drive in me. I just got done reading Lance Armstrong's book, It's Not About the Bike. Wow. And, you know, he had that experience and he just went all all in. And this is before the the whole, you know, yeah. performance enhancing yeah, exactly. thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just go all in on my business. I'm working 90 hours a week. And one night my wife's looking at me on the couch and she's crying and she's like, this is not what I signed up for. And, and keep in mind that she had just given her life up. Wow for four months of taking care of someone who was sick and grumpy and she didn't know if I was going to make it. And I had nothing to offer her at the time. That's some tough. Like, it's not like she was going to get a million bucks if I died. Yeah. Yeah. No life insurance, nothing. And so I look at her and I'm like, this isn't going to work. And I was ready to quit. But the next week I got an email from someone that forwarded to me that had a, a coaching call and it, it said systems structure 40 hours a week, I don't remember anything else except that because that's exactly what I did not know how to do. <laughs> I had sticky notes all over my computer. Everyone called me at all hours of the night, I had no boundaries at all. And I did not know how to fix that. Mm. No one ever showed me how to fix that. Like yeah. back then, and even now to some degree, if you get into real estate or mortgage, they say, here's a desk, here's a phone, good luck. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't like curriculum or training there's a lot more today than there was back then. So I jump on this call and this guy is telling me about systems and structure. And I think they did two things for me. Number one, it told me there's a way and there's people that know how, <laughs> but yeah. number two, it spoke to that ADHD part of me. Yeah. And I was, I, I really resonated with that. I was like, man, so far the, the small amount of structure I had in my life, it made me feel good. Mm -hmm. It made me feel peace. So I jumped on a plane and flew out to a conference in two weeks. Oh, I love that about I've been you, with man. That, I've been with that group ever <laughs> since, That's and cool. they've changed my life forever, yeah. You know, I think, um, I know I struggle with this a lot, but I, I, I think at times when you, maybe it's when you're younger, yeah. you feel like structure is an inhibitor, mm -hmm. when actually structure is the biggest freedom enabler mm -hmm. you can possibly have. It totally is. When like, you systemize mm -hmm. things, like, I know you've taught me a ton on this, but it's like, it frees you up mm -hmm. to be able to do the things that you actually want to do. It's, it's what a laser is, right? A laser is just highly, highly intensely focused light mm -hmm. and it can do anything. It can burn through anything. It can split atoms. It can do all kinds of magical things. This thing. I mean, honestly, for me, I stepped into it out of necessity running the school, but also too, because of the pain of not having it. Yeah. Yeah. And like you, the messes, the catastrophic messes, be it financially, relationally, when you don't. I mean, I just got back from uh, directing this weekend and I, my schedule was all off. I didn't have my protein shake. My All, all my patterns, yeah. I was off. Yeah. I, I literally have felt like an idiot, like yeah. wandering through a field yeah, today you, because yeah. I'm like, man, there's just, there's something about channeling specifically, I think for innovative and creative people. Chris, as we wrap this episode, what advice would you give to your younger self looking back today? Man, I've been asked that question a few times. I, I think that, Ask for help earlier. Yeah, that's good. You know, I mean, on the one hand, I don't know if I would have been able to, but I just think asking for help, man, you know, they, they, they say surrender is joining the winning side, huh. you know, and there's so much about specifically men, but women too, where the idea of asking for help and surrendering and saying, I don't know what I'm doing. It's just, it's so hard to do that, but man, that is, that is where it all started for me. Mm -hmm. so well, we would... see the fruit of it, brother. I mean, you're so humble. I mean, the fact that you hear about, you know, off of an email, you're on a plane seeking and posturing yourself mm -hmm. to be mentored and to learn. I'm so excited to hop into the second episode yep. because we want to pick your brain around why creatives suck with money. 
Let's do it. <laughs> or why most people yeah. suck with money, to be honest. <laughs> Not just creatives. It's, it's true. It, it's, it's true. true. Yeah. Most people suck with money. <laughs> so most you people. need to watch this episode. Great hanging out with you. And we'll see you soon on the next episode of Story. <laughs>